and everything stops for tea. Well, a very good morning, Friday, the 19th of March, 10 o'clock, and welcome to a very sunny uh, Bojnair, uh, Bogner Regis, and uh, welcome to the second A Cup of Tea with Mr. G, coming live from the Bohemian Cottage in the Sky, or otherwise known as my flat. And I'm very, very pleased to be talking to a gentleman um, who is, I'm going to introduce right now, and that's uh, John, John Price. Are you there, John? Good morning, Chris. Nice to see you. How are you? No, I'm but we've right, never met. We've never met, have we, John? No, we've spoken over the phone, but this is the first time we've actually um, been able to talk face to face. It's absolutely lovely. And uh, the reason I, I got to meet John is when when my Lindy passed away, I wanted to do something to uh, try and raise money for the doctors and nurses. And uh, this is how I got to speak to you. And uh, I wanted that money to go specifically to the hospital. How how can you actually arrange that? Because your your work, I, I'm a big admirer of your work, but how can you actually ring fence money to go to a particular department I, in the I hospital? Think is, the easiest way to explain it, Chris, is um, how most charities tend to work. They tend to raise money and put it into a central fund, and then yeah. everybody takes a little piece out of that fund. We're slightly different as a charity. One of our unique ways we do things is we have individual pots of uh, and funds for each area of care. So it may be uh, a ward that somebody's had some care in, or it may be a uh, an, an outpatient unit, somewhere like a cancer unit or something like that. And we manage over 170 different funds uh, within the hospital wow. where um, we're very conscious that our donors are very uh, attached to certain areas of care. So we can make sure that the money that they raise can go back to say thank you to the area of care that they've really, really had that that wonderful sort of care from the nurses and the doctors to make sure that they're going back into the area um, that they want to say thank you for. That's fantastic. How did you get involved in um, your work? And, um, and if, if I could just explain something to uh, the, the uh, people who are tuning in, uh, your charity can you just explain exactly which area your charity covers okay yeah of course chris um so we love your hospital we're the dedicated charity for western sussex foundation trust okay um and that is a trust that looks after three hospitals okay we have st richard's in chichester we have worthing hospital and we have a, a satellite hospital at shoreham on sea called southlands so they're the only three hospitals that we raise funds for and every penny that we raise goes directly back into patient uh, care and staff welfare at those three hospitals. Fantastic. And how did you become involved? It's a bit of a long story, really. I, I've worked for the hospital now um, for nearly eight years, coming up to eight years. And to start with, I, I joined the trust um, as the front of house manager for the restaurant. I've always dealt um, with people in front of house with people. And, and I worked there for two, two and a half years front of house. And then I moved on to what we call the patient advice and liaison service, the PALS service, which deals with um, people that may have concerns about um, care that they've had within the hospital and trying to help those people make sure they've got resolutions and find some answers to any care that they, they may, may question or have had, uh, concerns about. So that was a very challenging job as well. And within that time, I've done numerous fundraisers for the hospital. Um, and we've done various things like climbing Ben Nevis and, and raising, we, I think as, as a group, we raised nearly £20,000 um, climbing Ben Nevis to give back to the hospital. And um, the manager at the time said to me, have I ever thought of working in the charitable sort of area in, in, the, in the spectrum of charity? Mm -hmm. And it's something I hadn't, okay, I, I hadn't thought about it at all. But when I sat back and looked at it, I thought, do you know what? This is something that I, would, I think I'd really enjoy um so when the job became available i applied and i had no charity experience i had no background within the charity sector um but i applied i, I did my research and i was lucky enough to be offered the job and chris i think i'm the luckiest man in the hospital to be honest with you because i think it's a job that enables me every day to work with people and help people and give something back to the hospital and the patients that are there how many people work in your team john we've got a very small team chris there's only four of us um so there's myself who is the only fundraiser so i'm the only person um within three hospitals that, that fundraises i have my colleague denise 
who uh, is our marketing lady. I think you've spoken to Denise previously. Yeah, she's very helpful. Yeah, and then we have a young lady called Jez, who is our finance lady, so deals a lot with the um, inquiries into the office and any of the finance that comes into the office. And then we have um, my interim head of charity, which is David. Um, um, he joined us last. He was only meant to be with us for six months. He's now been with us 18 months because um, I think he loves his job and doesn't really want to go. So so it's, it's, it's really nice. So, yeah, we're a really small team, but a really proactive and, and um, um, energetic team that gets things done. What's the biggest challenge at the moment? Because you hear in the news, obviously, charities are suffering due to the COVID and uh, uh, places not being able to open. What, what would you say is your biggest challenge as a, a charity fundraiser? I think within our charity, Chris, we're, we're really lucky. We have a really sort of good link in with our local community and um, our local community tend to put on a lot of events for us. So we're event based. So we tend to be um, lots and lots of people would be putting on events at weekends through the summer, around Christmas time. OK, and then people would attend these events and, and generate funds that way. Obviously, for the last 18 months, that hasn't happened. Um, we haven't put any events on since February, not this February, February before was our last event. So we've now pretty much had, uh, as I say, maybe 13, 14 months with no events. So um, we, we're lucky that our profile is quite high within the within the charity sector. So the NHS has been very much to the fore. Um, but coming out of lockdown, hopefully that releases a little bit of pressure on us when we can start to to go back and start planning a few events to brainstorm more. Talk, talking about events, I've got this picture here. <laughs> <laughs> so that was obviously when we could do events. Talk, talk to me through this picture. What was happening? Okay, so, so that picture, that was my first event that I ever organised for the um, charity when I started working for them. And they'd never done a, a skydive before. And cha uh, uh, charities tend to do skydives as quite a, a normal activity. Um and I, I'm not very good with heights, Chris, I promise you. You give me two No, bites. and you're going skydiving. <laughs> okay, up a ladder, and, and that's not me, okay? Um, and I was going around our staff members and, and our, our supporters trying to say to people, you know, please come and do a skydive for us, raise some funds for us. Um, and the first question everybody would ask me was, John, are you doing it? And, of course, I'd be going, no, I'm not doing it. I'm scared of heights. It's, why would I do that? Um, and I found very quickly that, if I was saying no, everybody else would say no. Whereas if I said yes, I'll do it, um, then people tended to say, oh, okay, well, I'm, maybe I'll do it. Um, so, yeah, very quickly I got um, signed up to do the skydive, which I thought I'd never do, um, and ended up coming out of an aeroplane at 15,000 feet, which is the highest tandem skydive you can do in the country, um, and raised over a £1,000 back to the charity. But I was a, one of a Fantastic. group of seven or eight people and all raising similar amounts of money. So, what yeah. was that feeling before you left the plane? What was going through your mind? Uh, honestly, Chris, I was petrified. Okay, I'll be Wait. totally honest with you. But actually, once you're out and you're coming down at terminal velocity, and you're you're then you pull the parachute and you have that complete silence and that serenity that you have when the parachute's open and you're floating to ground, um, and then the euphoria when you come down and the adrenaline rush that you have is incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And we're really lucky that we've been able to reorganise another one. We were due to do one last year, which got postponed because of COVID. Um, and we've actually got one on the 8th of August this year. And mm. currently, I think I've got nearly 20 people signed up for it. So, How can uh, people find details of that, John? Okay, so, I mean, if they contact um, the hospital charity, okay, so um, you could just dial into the hospital and ask to speak to the charity team. Okay, um, you can contact them there. Okay, or you can contact them directly on my email. Chris, I'll, I'll, I'll say my email now if that's okay. Yeah, okay. please do. So, so it's john.price and then the number four at nhs.net. Okay, I'll repeat that. So it's john.price, the number four at nhs.net. If anybody's interested, please drop me an email, okay, with your number, and I'll call you straight back, and we can talk about it, and then obviously we can... John, the... the word on the street is hopefully things are going to start to improve <clears throat> and excuse me for your fundraising events that's going to be great news so um i'm obviously come from the entertainment world and being an impressionist and a lot of friends of mine 
um they are big supporters of charity so where do you see things going in in the short future as to trying to get back to live events and what sort of events have you done in the past that uh, have been popular uh well we we've done various events throughout the year really and and i always say to people that whatever you want to do we can almost help you organize whether it be a coffee morning okay or to climb mount everest and everything in between so we never really say no to anything chris there's, there's always okay um something that we can look at about organizing a style of event but i think in the in the mean in the short term i think it's more about going back to events where people can get together i think that's the big yes. thing. i think everybody has been locked away in lockdown um yeah and i, I suppose in, in in a very personal way I've, I've been lucky i've gone to work every day there's lots yeah. of people that haven't had that opportunity to do that and and i think the actual face-to-face -face events where we're um back talking to people and communicating and and being face-to-face yeah. yeah. -face, i think that's the big thing and whether that be in a um a charity ball or a charity concert or um singing concert at christmas all these type of events were held previously for us um and obviously uh people haven't been able to do that so it'd be really nice to get them back to supporting um all, all our local community and the community events because um yeah. that's very much a part of my job well there's there's one thing which i can um I've spoken to you before about supporting any events in regards to live entertainment, but I also do comedy lectures. So a comedy lecture with a coffee morning, if you think that's something that can be a soft rollout and, and uh, money come in from that to the charity, then we, we must speak on that because people, I think people just need to have a, a, a bit of a laugh, a bit of something just to change the mood. There, there's, It's been very, very hard uh, this particular lockdown and uh, uh if that's something which i can help with then then let's talk about that you know me i'm always trying to think of ways to to raise money for for the charity uh, and thank you thank you for buying a ticket i know you're a big manchester united fan yeah who, who's, who's, who, who's your favorite player oh ever? now manchester there's united. a question there's a really difficult question because I've, I've been lucky enough chris I'm, i've followed manchester united since since I was a child, and I've been lucky enough to um, have friends and contacts within within football. My my background's within football, um, so I've been lucky enough to have contacts to get tickets to go and watch games. And yeah. I've seen some incredible players, you know. And and you're talking the real top end. Um, yeah. Talking from Brian Robson, who was my hero as I was growing up, right the way through to David Beckham, Cristiano Ronaldo, Eric Cantona. You know, these type of players yeah. are absolute legends in my eyes. You know, so. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you said David Beckham there, you know, John, because I'll be very upset if you didn't say David. I'd have to say, Victoria, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and, and as I say, I mean, I, I've been lucky that I, I tend to go most seasons, in a normal season, yeah. up to Old Trafford um, three or four times. I've got a little bit of a family background in, in Manchester, so I've still got nephews and that that live up oh. there. So I would go and stay with them and, and go to the games yeah. from there. So, well, so, yeah, so that's I, I thank you for buying ticket because uh, just to remind people, um, they must get sick of me, but you know, you, you just have to keep waving the flag. Um, John is one of many people who bought uh, a ticket, £10 ticket, and that was to go to a fabulous prize, and that's uh, two VIP. Um, it's, it's a a tour of the old Trafford Stadium, including lunch, and on this, Rose, who is I don't know if you if you saw my cup of tea, Mr. G, with Rose Cook Monk. She obviously formed the Duncan Edwards Foundation, and the work that she does in Dudley is fantastic. That she has a museum. Uh, if you've never seen it, and being a Manchester United fan, what what's going to happen is the the uh, ticket. We're, we're splitting that between the hospital charity and also her foundation because I want to be able to try and support her work. But on the third of April. Uh, we're going to have a COVID-free uh, draw at the museum. And I've asked Rose to give a virtual tour of the Duncan Edwards Foundation. So if you, if you want to uh, have a look at that, but if you're ever up in Dudley, you'll be welcome with open arms. And it's, uh, you know, there again, another Manchester United football legend. And uh, I'll, I'll get very emotional when I actually go to the museum because they've, they've put so much work into it. Um, 
the uh, I think it's a, a fabulous prize. A lot of people say, well, what happens if I don't like football? Hello? <laughs> really? There are people <laughs> who don't like football? Yeah, there are people. Um, y- you can you can give it as a prize to somebody. And, of course, because of COVID, the extension of the uh, the, the expiry has been we've, – we've just said, okay, when COVID is easier and people can actually go out and do these things – you can use that at any time. So thank you. And thank you to the other people who are supporting that. Hopefully that's going to raise uh, uh, some money and then we can get some more money into the pot. At the moment, uh, I think the the charity fund, which, uh, and it's not me, it's the very, very kind people who um, supported the doctors and nurses in the ward, in the Pagan ward where Corky was, uh, is at £1,040, which I was absolutely, I set £50 as my my starting thing 50 pounds that, that's then, incredible uh, chris that's incredible yeah, well you know she died on the 24th of january and i just i just couldn't believe the kindness and generosity of people and i think it's one of these things though is that when when time goes on sometimes uh, things drop off and i'm just really wanting to keep I want to keep the memory of my wife alive, but I also want to celebrate her life and not, you know, remember her death. And I think doing the charity work and raising money for the hospital, it's so, the docs and nurses, they just blew me away how much care uh, that they uh, give to patients. And it's 24 seven. And it's, I, I don't know how they do it. And, Chris, uh, Chris, can I jump in there? I mean, um, yeah. I, I just want to echo, echo exactly what you said there. I mean, I'm lucky enough to work at the, the trust and you see it, day in day out as you say 365 days a year and you hear stories that are absolutely phenomenal and um i think what happens is because of the care and and the doctors and nurses being so invested in their roles i think that transfers out into the local community and i'm local chris i was born and raised in chichester okay so my loved ones and all my family are all local as well so that's my local hospital so richard's is my local hospital um and i think what happens then is because people are affiliated with that hospital and they know that the care that's given there i think then they buy into to actually saying thank you okay and yeah. and you should never forget that um you know there for the grace of god go all of us that we are all dependent on that hospital and let's make it the best we can make it so that's yeah, what, that's, that's my philosophy about what i do so can I show a little video clip of the work that you do? Would that be all right? I've yeah, got a little course, please do. Here, and yeah, please here do. we go. Well, I think it's fantastic. And the other thing I want to ask you, John, is that um, we talk about donations to the charity, but what happens if people want to get involved becoming a volunteer? Um, what process would they need to take on that? Yeah, OK, so we, we actually have a volunteers manager within the hospital, and, and we're really lucky that um, as a hospital we have, we have lots of volunteers, and we're very reliant on volunteers when we hold our events um but not just there that there's lots of ways to volunteer in the hospital as well so you can volunteer by going and sitting with a patient with um, dementia and playing games with them board games or obviously this is covid allowing 
um you know you could go and have a cup of tea and just catch up with somebody with dementia you can go and help on the wards um with just some admin support or that type of thing okay the, the, there's lots and lots of ways to um come into the hospital and help you know outside of COVID patients. um the lady that anybody would need to contact at the hospital is a lady called claire goldsmith she's the volunteers manager and there is a small induction program that you would have to go through we have to obviously run sure. checks and personal uh, background checks and stuff like that but yeah i mean that's that's we are reliant and, and we have a wonderful wonderful team of volunteers that support us already but i know we're always looking for volunteers there's always roles that can be filled within the hospital which um are essential to the running of the place as well yeah well i, I really yeah. wish you your team the hospital charity a continued success i know the work that you do is absolutely fantastic uh, hopefully i'm going to have the chance to get uh, involved with you as I say the couple of ideas um i'm going to take you off air now i'm going to raise my tea my cup what are you drinking today john chris i just want to just quickly one thing before we go okay yeah. when covid allows okay i personally want to invite you in to come and meet the charity team love to see some of the work that we do okay so i'd love to have you in for a proper cup of tea i'm drinking tea okay so tea. A proper cup of tea we'll have one face to face okay and i'd love you yeah. to come in and meet the guys i'll look, I'll look forward to that i'll look okay. forward to that i'm i'm gonna t god bless you I'm going to take you off air now, and then I'm going to just tell people before I come off air, we, we've got another idea that came up, and uh, my corky, she collected vintage handbags and purses, and I gave those out to a lot of her friends uh, at the funeral and, and friends who couldn't be at the funeral, so I've sent all those off. But then I thought, well, all her collection of um, clothes, her classic collection of clothes, so... We're going to, in the process of putting these as a charity auction, and half the money is going to go to the charity, half the money is going to go to the Duncan Edwards. Wow. So that is, uh, I'm going to just quickly mention that. We're, we're at the moment cataloguing, and there again on the uh, 3rd of April, I'll be going to the museum having a COVID-free um, cup of tea with Mr. G. I'll announce the winning bids, and then we just ask for a small donation for postage. So... Um, It'll be like it'll be like I'll be like David Dickinson. So my first name is a Ralph Lauren thing. I reckon it went to auction. So I'll be very annoying doing David Dickinson with that. But <laughs> hey, anything to get some money for charity, eh? John, Chris, thank you ever so much. <laughs> my pleasure, Chris. Uh, lovely to talk to you. Lovely to talk to you and uh, have a have a very good uh, a comic relief today. So I don't know where you know everybody's going to be doing something hopefully today and, and giving some money out to charity, which is what it's all about. So, John, uh, I look forward to meet you in the flesh over a cup of tea. And thanks ever so much for your time today. No problem at all, Chris. Take care now. Cheerio. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye. So that was uh, John. What a lovely, lovely chap. And um, as I just mentioned before, we are going to start a uh, it's going to be called Corky's Collection. Now, uh, my Corky, she loved she loved good things. If she couldn't afford good things, then she wouldn't. You know, she would wait until she could actually afford to buy stuff. But over the years, um, like with her handbags, her vintage handbags and her vintage purses, her clothes, her classic collection of clothes, um, myself and Rose, because we're going to split the money between the two charities, the hospital charity and the Duncan Edwards Foundation. We are going to start an auction and this is going to take place very, very sh shortly. I'm going to be putting items of cloth up, clothing up and you'll have until 12 o'clock lunchtime on the 1st of April to place your bid. And to place your bid, you simply put a comment uh, in uh, the comments box with your bid. And then on the 2nd of April, we'll uh, contact people who got the winning bid, obviously get the payment through. And on the 3rd of April, live from the Duncan Edwards uh, Museum in Dudley, I shall be announcing all the winning bids. Uh, we shall be having a virtual tour uh, from Rose of the Duncan Edwards Museum. And also I'll be announcing the uh, winner of the wonderful prize, the VIP, two VIP um, tickets to have a tour of Old Trafford, including lunch. So please, uh, it's £10 a ticket. Please just put a comment in the box when you've actually bought a ticket. We can make sure that you're in the draw. As you can see, these are just a couple of things uh, which we are getting ready for Corky's collection. So thank you so much for joining me.
and uh, join my guest John today. If you would like to come on and have a virtual cup of tea with Mr. G, then that's my headphone just gone. Uh, please private message me. I've got lots and lots of guests who have already done so, and I'm looking forward to talk to them on Monday. I've got a young 23-year-old entrepreneur, which I met on a cruise ship called Nathan Brett, and he's going to be talking to me about how he took the uh, giant leap into being um, an entrepreneur and obviously how things have affected him due to the COVID. So comic relief today. I hope you have a great, great day from me, Christopher G. Uh, as always, I'm going to sign off uh, with this and uh, cheers. Okay, fellas, take it away. And everything's up for tea.